Hello everybody, welcome to this video. Um, I'm going to discuss with you, I would like to discuss with you some interesting consequences of the uh, quasi-static approach that we uh, came up uh, uh, as a necessary assumption to, to move from Maxwell's equations to Kirchhoff's law. This um, quasi-static approach will have interesting consequences and uh, let's go through, through them. So the, the, the first one I would like to discuss There you go. So the first one, it has to do with the fact that uh, at some point we ended up with this assumption that the dBdt should be uh, zero. We came up with this assumption after applying uh, yeah, again the quasi-static approach to Faraday law in the integral form. But let's have a look at what happens to Faraday law in the differential form. So if the dBdt is zero, that means, in the differential form of Faraday law, that the curl of E equals zero. Normally, here, you will see minus dBdt. But now, since dBdt is zero, then the curl of E is zero. Now, mathematically, what I can do, if I know that I have a vector field which is irrotational, like this one, I can also represent any irrotational field as the gradient of a scalar field. Let's call this Psi. Because I know that the gradient of any scalar field is always irrotational. By convention, here we have the minus sign. That's the minus sign that sometimes mess things up. But okay. Um, so I know that the curl of E is zero under quasi-static conditions, of course, and I also know that the curl of the gradient of any scalar function is also always zero. So why not make these two things equal to each other? I can always make these things and they will, they will always be equal eh, unless some constant that will separate them, but I can characterize that constant. So I can express my electric field as the gradient of another um, another scalar field, called in this uh, in this example with the letter psi, but this is what we know as the scalar potential. Scalar potential. Potential. Now we have to be careful about something because I'm actually always allowed to express my vector as the gradient of a scalar potential. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean that I need quasi-static approaches to do this. The, the elect, if, I, if I'm able to find a scalar potential whose gradient can represent my field, even if my, even if my field is indeed rotating, but I'm always allowed to do that. When, where is the problem here? Well, the problem is that all this is math. Eh? So when, when, when the curl of a vector field is zero, we in math we say that this field E is irrotational. But what does it mean? This is math. Eh? This is math. This is math talking. What does it mean physically? Well, what it means is that irrotational fields for math, uh, in physics, we call those conservative. Eh? It is conservative. Conservative fields. Eh? If the field is conservative, what is going to happen? Well, imagine we have we have we have the the electric field with a certain distribution in space and I'm going to I'm going to do the usual integration of the electric field between point A and point B uh, following a certain path say this is path C1 so I'm going to integrate between A and B this is a minus and uh, this minus comes from here the electric field dot dl following path z1 and this is going to give me a certain number a certain 
result, right? But I could also I could also define another path of integration, say this one. We call this C2. And then integrate also from A to B, but following C2. C2. Now, if my field is conservative, which means that it's irrotational, which means that we are under quasi-static conditions, these two integrals are the same. They are the same. They have the same number. And why are the same? Because the potential between a point A and B only depends only depends on the potential on the final point of my integration to the final to the initial point of my integration. Both these integrals are the same and they are equal to the potential at point B minus the potential at point A. Which is another way of saying that my the integral of my electric field does not depend on the path of integration. It doesn't depend if I take C1, C2, or any other even crazy path that I would I can think about. I can go and back and forth. I only it only matters if I if I start at point A and I finish at point B. That's the only thing that matters for my potential. Now Again, this is only true, only true, if my field is conservative. And my field is conservative only if it is rotational. That means that this is only true for quasi-static approach. In general, in general, when there is a time-changing magnetic field, even though I'm always able to calculate this integral, because no, no one is forbidding me to calculate the integral between A and B of the electric field, the problem that I'm going to encounter is that for non-static uh, conditions, these two integrals are different. They have a different number. And this is uh, something we have seen also in demonstrations during lectures, where we measure voltages between two points, and depending on the path of integration, these things give different results. So, this is the first interesting consequence of quasi-static approach. Let me talk briefly about the second one the second one so quasi static approach for us meant that the the d d d t equals zero and that the d b d t should also equal zero well when 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 this is true well basically there are two basic conditions where this is true the first condition is when d and b are constant constant in time constant in time so they don't change with time they are ideally dc fields or extremely low frequency so even if they can be of a really high value but if they don't change the time derivative will always give zero but there's another condition that uh, I propose also to think about during lectures. What if the permeability and sorry, the permittivity and the permeability in my problem can be approximately uh, equal to zero? Forget about units, Faraday per meter, Henry per meter, you know what I mean. Eh? So if my problem allows epsilon and mu to be fairly close to zero, then, uh, well, even if the fields are changing in time, and even if they are, even if E and H are of high value, if epsilon and mu are very small, yeah, then uh, m maybe there's a chance I can assume quasi-static conditions. And to be honest, uh, think about this constant. What are these values? So epsilon naught, for instance, the per permittivity of, of, of vacuum, this is approximately 8.8. 85 10 to the minus 12 Faraday per meter. Eh? Come on, eh? it's, it's not zero, but it's pretty close to zero. Mu naught here is eh? 4 pi 10 to the minus 7 Henry per meter. So again, 
it's this tiny, tiny, tiny uh, um, uh, constant. So we, if we can assume this to be zero, look what happens. Uh, this is an important constant in nature is the speed of light in a certain medium. So for instance, speed of light in vacuum, which is calculated one over the square root of epsilon mu, if we are talking about vacuum, is epsilon naught mu naught. That means that this uh, is up tending to infinity, because these two are tending to zero, more or less. If the speed of light is tending to um, infinity, let's see, we have another important relationship in uh, in uh, physics called the dispersion relationship. It's, a, it's another way of writing the dispersion relationship. C is lambda times f. Eh? So this is a relationship linking the spatial characteristics of a wave, like the wavelength, with the time characteristics of the wave, which is which is are here, and eh? the frequency. So if this is infinite, if C is almost infinite, what do we have? Well, we can have a wavelength that tends to infinity, so an extremely, extremely long wavelength, or and or a frequency that tends to infinity, or a period, eh, a period of a wave that tends to zero. Eh? For infinite frequencies, we have a zero uh, period in the, in um, in uh, in uh, in the limit. Right? What does it mean? Okay, let's let's think of uh, our problem. Our problem is a certain circuit with a, with a source and a load, and this can be as complicated as you want. Doesn't really matter. So we have your load, you have your source. This is not what matters to me. My circuit will have a certain length. That's my characteristic uh, length. It can be one centimeter or one kilometer, depending on which problem I'm solving. It's just L. Now, the source generates a wave, and that wave travels in the system until it reaches the load. If the speed at which my wave is traveling is infinite, which means that for this particular case, epsilon and mu can be considered to be zero, which means I can assume quasi-static conditions. So if the speed of light here is infinite, that uh, means that almost in instantaneously, whatever, whatever value I have here uh, from the source, this is transmitted almost in instantaneously to the load. There's no delay uh, between one end of my circuit at the other end of and the other end of my circuit. That means there are no propagative effects. Eh? And that means that also the wavelength can be considered really, really very large. So if I take, for instance, the ratio L over lambda, which is a very important ratio in electrical engineering, transmission line theory, etc., we call this the electrical electrical size eh? electrical size eh? is, is how do you determine if something is large or small well it's large or small depending on the wavelength you are you're dealing with so if you have a finite l a finite thing but you are working under quasi static conditions that will mean that lambda is infinite so this um, this uh, term over here is approximately zero. In practice, we say it's much, much lower than one, much lower than one. Say fiftieth, uh, for instance. That's much lower than one. That's the idea of an electrically small object. An electrically small object will allow us to assume quasi-static conditions. Let me, for a second, rewrite this. So L can be uh, is taken there, and then here we have lambda can be also written as C times the pe period of my wave, eh? so one over the frequency. And look at this number over here. What 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 could be representing? Well, this is first of all it has a units of time, and it's the time that it takes a wave 
to go from the beginning of my circuit or system to the end of my circuit. We call this the characteristic time, tau. Okay? The characteristic time is the time that it takes for my electromagnetic wave to travel the characteristic distance or the characteristic dimension of my problem. So tau over, uh, tau over t is also another criteria and if we follow the derivation this should also be more or less equal to zero. In practice we say this should be much much lower than, uh, than one. These are criteria, eh? rule of thumbs that sometimes can fail but in general they, 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 um, they are pretty much okay that will allow us to in to understand under which conditions we can safely apply quasi-static approaches.